guys, it's Shaylin and I'm here today with another writing video. So I'm very excited about this topic. This is actually a video that I've made two times before and I had issues with the footage both times. So third time's the charm. I've been trying to get this one to you guys literally since like September. We're gonna be talking about verbing nouns. One of my favorite things, a writing technique that I personally adore, it's taking a noun or you know, maybe even an adjective, some word that's not a verb and using it as a verb. It's a fun technique. It's definitely something that's a bit stylish right now, I would say. Certainly it's not something that everyone uses. It's certainly like a bit of a trendy technique at the moment, I would say. It's one of my favorites. First of all, I just want to talk about why this is a technique I personally love. You know, this is not a technique that everyone likes and just to be straight up here, if you don't like this technique, simply don't do it. This video is here for people who like this technique, and I certainly get that it's not for some people. Some people don't like flashier prose. They like prose style to be more invisible, and with their work they want a more invisible prose style, and this is definitely a technique that draws attention to the language rather than camouflages it, so it's certainly not for everyone, and I'm not trying to say that this is good writing and a writing style needs this and a good sentence needs this and all your verbs should be made up. Um, this is definitely something that you want to use purposely, intentionally, maybe even sparingly, and if it's not a technique you like, just don't do it. So reasons why I personally love this technique, first of all, is it's just, it's fun. I like having fun and I like the language to be fun. You know, I like it when there's a sense of fun and joy to the language itself, when the language is kind of tasty, you know? When you read a sentence and there's a, a word that's used so perfectly but so surprisingly that you have that oh moment and it's, it's fun, you know? It lifts up the sentence, it lifts up the image. And I love that uh, personally as a reader and as a writer. I love vivid, funky, weird prose as a reader and therefore I also like it as a writer. Number two, I think that it allows you to add layers of meaning to a sentence through the different implications of the verb. You can integrate subtext, meaning, different levels of implication into the verb. Three, it allows you to vary sentence structure and remove similes. So for me, the simile has always been a bit of a crutch in my work. I've always had a tendency to rely maybe a little too heavily on the simile. And so with a lot of these verbs, and we'll talk about this later on, you'll find that you're able to condense an entire simile into a single verb. And so that allows you to vary the sentence structure a lot if you tend to overload on similes like me. It also allows your writing to be denser with imagery while cutting back on the number of words. That's one thing I really like about this technique is that it adds this vividness, this punch, this originality to your prose, but it actually does that with fewer words. You know, there's always the risk of prose becoming overwrought or denser tangled when you're too focused on the prettiness of it or the complexity of it. But this technique, what I think is kind of special about it is that you're actually able to simplify your sentences while increasing the density of imagery. Because a lot of these verbs come from rearranging a simile you're able to cut that like a uh, or as the as construction. You're replacing the verb with the object of comparison. In other cases, it often allows you to cut the was, uh, which is a really weak verb. Was is one of the weakest verbs there is. Um, was or any conjugation of the verb to be usually is a very weak verb. Um, it just has no sensory value. And so when you're able to replace that verb with a stronger verb, you can end up with a much more concise sentence, but one that like really packs a punch. I think that's what I like about this technique is it it's very punchy. And I that's I like that in style. I like shorter sentences, but really punchy constructions. And the final reason I really love this technique is because verbs are inherently active, right? Verbs are the movement of a sentence. They're the doing, they're the action. Making that action, the movement word, stronger, more original, really can make the writing more visceral. It makes the image action-based. Rather than a static image, you are getting an active image. I think it just makes the writing very dynamic, very full of life. That's one reason why verbs are so important beyond just making up verbs, just in general why verbs are so important. They're the active part of the sentence, they're the life of a sentence. And that's why I think focusing on making them stronger is so important. And making your verbs stronger doesn't necessarily mean making up weird verbs all the time. It might just mean carefully choosing a better synonym. Or if you have a few verbs in a sentence, whittling them back so there's one but it's really strong. Or trying to replace the verb was with something stronger. To write strong verbs, you don't always need a weird, funky, made up verb or even something strange. Sometimes it's just something that's more precise or less familiar, you know, defamiliarizing the verb. Add on here as a sixth point is it defamiliarizes the language, right? Verbs can become cliche, to be honest, right? So what does the sun do? 
it shines, right? The sun is always shining, right? Like that's the verb we associate with the sun. So replacing the verb shines with something more original. And you can find a verb that's more particular to what you want the sentence to be conveying. But defamiliarizing your verbs is a really great way to make your sentences more punchy, your writing more interesting. Um, and I always think verbs are kind of the place to start with that. And this technique just really takes it to the next level. So let's talk about some rules of thumb when you're making up verbs. Number one, it should sound right. When you're making up verbs, you almost want to think of them as a form of onomatopoeia. So words that sound like what they're doing. Let's say that I had a fun idea and I, this isn't a made up verb, this is an existing verb, but it illustrates the same point. Let's say that I wanted to say that sunlight cleaved through the curtains. The thing is, that's just, that's not what sunlight does. In this case especially, sunlight is something very soft. It's gentle, right? It's sunlight lighting up a curtain. Cleave is hard, it's sharp. It's sonically, that's not what the sunlight is doing. So sound is a kind of a critical factor in terms of the sound conveying the action. Especially because when you're making up a verb, this is an un potentially unprecedented verb. We're not used to seeing this word as a verb. If the sound of the word doesn't reflect the action itself, it can feel very, very counterintuitive. This can be a bit off the wall. Like you can get a little wacky with these. Sometimes they're very inconspicuous when you make up verbs. Sometimes they're very strange. If you're veering, especially more on the strange side, if it doesn't sound right, it's very jarring for a reader and it's not going to convey the image that you were wanting it to convey. Number two, it should make sense. When you start getting into this technique, and I'm speaking from personal experience, but also a lot of people that I know, a lot of people fall a little too in love with this technique, and including myself. And sometimes when that happens, you stop paying attention to the logic, but the logic is very, very important here. The sound is important, but so is the logic, because just like if the sound doesn't make sense, if the logic behind the image doesn't make sense, the reader can't picture it. And that's what you want, right? You're trying to create a vivid image. And you won't be creating a vivid dynamic image if the situation you've created with the verb just simply doesn't make sense. Pulled an example here that was from my own writing and I didn't really think enough about the logic. A friend of mine, wonderful editor, had commented on it and commented that this verb is kind of illogical. And my main character was talking about her breath. The breath steams in the cold. And she said that her breath was water falling. And for me, I liked that image because waterfalls, you know, like they have like when they're fast, they have the white water. And so to me, it kind of had the same look as maybe breath freezing in the cold. But she was like, that doesn't make sense. Waterfalls fall down, your breath floats up. So that's actually not what your breath is doing. And I was like, oh yeah, so that was an illogical verb. The whole point of this is to create a dynamic image. And if it's illogical, the reader will just be confused and won't be picturing anything. You won't really be conveying anything. Number three, it's important to pay attention to tone as well. A lot of made up verbs, like I said earlier, can feel very fun. It can feel almost silly. This is a technique of brightness, I would say. Making up verbs in too serious of a context can be, again, very jarring because it's not totally correct. Again, not all made up verbs are going to sound fun or silly, but they can, they veer more often into that because there is a strangeness. You're using a word in a way that word was not intended to be used. Making the word do a little circus trick, a little backflip there, they can feel kind of silly. And so you do have to be really careful about the tonal context you're placing the verb within. Number four, try to play into your story's patterns or linguistic ecosystems. I've talked about linguistic ecosystems in past videos. I think I talked about them in my video on word choice um, and another one on short fiction. I'll leave both of those linked in the, in the description. This is when you create a cohesive pattern of language throughout your whole piece. You may use consistent threads of imagery or consistent sounds of words. So for example, in a piece, you may use a lot of more natural words, um, if that's accurate to the character and setting, or in another piece, you may use more scientific words, if that's more accurate to the piece or setting. Um, and this can get very specific, for example, using a lot of imagery, say, related to outer space. One way to ensure that these verbs, again, are cohesive with your stories, using them in a way that's consistent with the threads of imagery you've already created, these can be strange linguistic choices, and so making sure that it fits into the piece is very important. Um, and again, number five, ensuring that it's in character. This is always, this is something that if I don't mention this in a craft video, every single comment will be about it. So I'm saying it here. 
Word choice should always be in character. You should be reaching for words that are within your character's frame of knowledge and background, making connections that make sense for them to make. Again, these verbs are connection-based images. You're essentially taking a simile in most cases and compressing it into a verb. So if that's not a comparison that they would make if it was, you know, expanded into a whole simile, then it's probably not one that they would make in verb form either. And number six, uh, just don't get too carried away with it. Like I said earlier, people can get a little too into this technique. I got a little too into this technique because when you start using this technique, it can really make your sentences pop. You want all of your sentences to do that. When you make up a really amazing verb for the first time and you place that in your writing in a way that lifts up the sentence, you feel like you have to do that in every single sentence, right? Uh, I'm gonna quote a friend of mine that I went to university with who, one of the best verb maker uppers I've ever met, he was saying once that he was like, I've gotten way too carried away with it and y'all are next, you guys need to tone it back now too. Um, and he was basically like, I basically found the way to write the perfect sentence, the coolest, strangest verb, the most specific noun. And he was kind of talking about, he was like, I found the formula for the perfect sentence. When every sentence is the best sentence, none of them are the best sentence. And it's true, when you overload this technique or any poetic technique, your writing becomes too dense. A lot of them become reaches, you know, when you start feeling like you need to use a strange verb to make a sentence good, or every verb has to be funky, you start using ones that don't make sense, you start losing the logic behind it, losing the sound, because you're not using them when it's most effective, you're just using them because you feel like every sentence should have it to be a good sentence. Yeah, you do have to make sure you don't get too carried away. This technique, it's very easy to get carried away with this technique, because it's fun, and you see individual sentences being starting to pop in a way that maybe you haven't achieved before in your writing and so you feel like every verb needs to do that and you don't want that. Not every verb needs to do that. This is really something that you should be implementing at the right moment when you have that perfect verb. Not all the time for the sake of it. So now I quickly wanted to cover how do you write these, right? So if you're making up a verb, what does that look like? Um, there are several different techniques that you can do depending on the word. Ways that I've seen are using a hyphen and then ed, using an apostrophe d or just adding an ed as if it was any verb. And obviously this is, I'm assuming we're talking in past tense, but I would recommend just doing what makes most sense for the word. If it reads and it's legible, and if you can look at the verb and read the word as you want it to be read and pronounced without any punctuation, just with the ed at the end, then I would go with that. Sometimes you will find words that simply do not translate as well. In that case, you might use like an apostrophe d or something. It's kind of up to you. So now let's get into the, the juicy part and talk about the types of verbs. I've kind of tried to separate made up verbs into four different categories. So two of them are concrete and two of them are abstract. The concrete verbs are verbs where a concrete meaning of a word is being turned into a verb. And the abstract verbs are words where an abstract quality of a word is being turned into a verb. So number one, the first type of concrete verb is the noun verb. This is when the object is doing what it is, essentially. So you're taking a noun's static qualities and you're making them into the verb. This is what most people think of when they think of made up verbs, they think of noun verbs. So for example, she walked across the stage in stilettos. In this case, we have a noun which is stilettos, right? This character is wearing stilettos and I think there's a pretty particular way that you walk when you're wearing stilettos. I mean, not me. I can't walk in the lowest heel possible. So I, I don't even try. If I was walking in stilettos, I would be falling onto the ground. Um, but you know, I think when you're wearing very high heels, there's, there's a particular gait to that. And so I think that this is a good place where we can go, okay, maybe there's a, there's a verb to be drawn from this noun. So we could turn that into, she stilettoed across the stage. So she's wearing stilettos, that's affecting how she's walking. And so maybe she could just stiletto instead of walk. And in this case, I think because stilettos have a particular effect on how you walk and the sound of your footsteps, you can kind of pull a verb from that. So the second type of concrete verb is the adjective verb. So instead of turning a noun into a verb, we're turning an adjective into, the, into a verb. So this is where you take the adjective describing the noun and you turn that into the verb. For example, let's say we had the sentence, she takes a sip of floral tea. So in this case, our adjective is floral, which is describing the tea. We could turn that into the tea florals her lips. So what we're basically saying here is 
the T is floral. And so that floral quality of being floral is becoming ad active, it's floraline. So there's an activeness to that adjective now. So for another example, let's say you had the sentence, dusk cast blue light over the mountains. So in this case, our adjective is blue. So we could turn that into dusk blued the mountain. These ones really show how much you can condense the sentence, right? We're going from dusk cast blue light over the mountains to dusk blued the mountains. It's way fewer words. So now let's look at the abstract verbs. So number one is the simile verb. So this is, like I've said before, where you take a simile and you turn the noun or the object of comparison in the simile into the verb. So you're saying that something is like something else via the action it is doing. So here's an example here. Raindrops gather in her hair like pearls. So our simile here is like pearls. We're saying that the raindrops look like pearls and not that they are pearls. It's not like in the noun verb or the adjective verb where there was a concrete quality to the thing. In this case, we're just saying it looks like pearls. So that could turn into raindrops pearl her hair or in past tense, raindrops pearled her hair. Again, as you can see, we're actually making the sentence more concise, and I think that in this case, it's a very elegant verb. So you'll find that this is probably the easiest place to start when you're making up verbs is with your similes. Not every simile can be condensed into a verb, but some of them can. And it happens to me a lot where I'll write a sentence with a simile, which is very natural for me because I just naturally will write a lot of similes in my work. And then I'll just write it, I'm like, oh wait, wait, that can go over, back, 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 back. Verb. So the final one here is the illusion verb. This is probably the most difficult to pull off and also the one you'll see the least. This is when the verb is a reference to something outside of the story. So, you know, another work, a myth, whatever. This one's really not to be overused. You probably won't find it coming up too often in your work. I honestly couldn't even think of an example of this off the top of my head, so I just pulled one from a, a story that I've written because it's really the only time that I could think of having used this in my work. So you'll see in this one that the verb is actually a proper noun. I did rearrange the sentence just to make the sentence much simpler for the sake of the example. It used to be like, it was a pretty long sentence with this bit at the end, so just rearranged it so it's the example pretty much. She'll become a monstrous shape under the leaves medusa and eternal. So obviously Medusa, Greek myth, where when she looks at you, you turn to stone. So basically what this verb is saying is the act of medusa in someone is to petrify them. And so what this is basically saying, you could read the sentence as, she'll become a monstrous shape under the leaves, petrified and eternal. But instead of petrified, it's turned into medusa because medusa can petrify you. So it's very roundabout. Like when you think about that one word medusa, how much context is being smushed into that one word? It's so much. So the illusion verb will usually be the densest with context and the hardest to pull off. Um, it's a pretty rare one, but it, it sometimes they can be very, very cool. My favorite thing about this technique is that you can have layers of meaning. I think that sometimes when you use these verbs, it's just for a, a, a beautiful image. Like, you know that one earlier, rain pearls, raindrops pearl her hair. There's not necessarily levels of implication or meaning to that. It's just a nice image. But when you get into these more abstract verbs, which are harder to pull off sometimes, because you're literally fitting an entire comparison, an entire analogy into a single word, and you have to just hope that in the context it's conveying as you wanted, you can get end up with a lot of layers of meaning because of how much is being condensed into one word. So I pulled this one example from my writing. I was just, I've been working on editing my book and I came across this example and I was like, that's one of the weirdest verbs I've ever created for sure in my life. So again, I wish I could have just found an example from someone else. I hate using my own examples, but I sifted through my whole book shelf trying to find a good example of a verb like this and I couldn't find one. Um, I'm sure they exist. I'm not saying that it's not because they're not out there. I just, it, it's luck. I haven't been able to stumble across one, but I remember in my own writing exactly where they are. So this is the sentence and we'll talk a little about the verb, how there's some levels to it. The water stain on your ceiling looks like the side profile of a woman's face. She's the first person you see each morning and also the last you see each night. A psychologist would say you're seeing your mother's face row sharked in the drywall, but it doesn't look like her. I don't know what, what came upon me in that moment. It's saying the stain on your ceiling looks like the ink blots of a Roshark test, right? Like if we were 
unraveling that verb, you would have to have a whole other sentence in there. You would have to say, the stain looks like the ink blots of a rope shark test. A psychologist would say you're seeing your mother's face in the drywall, but it doesn't look like her. A lot uh, condensed into one verb. There's also a lot of levels of implication to that verb. It's not just saying it looks like the influx of a rope shark test. It's also saying the main character is trying to understand her own psychology by asking herself what she thinks this looks like, you know? That's a recurring theme in the book. The main character trying to understand herself psychologically is an understand and make sense of her own mental state. That's a very constant aspect of this main character. And then there's also the question of the woman's face, right? Like, who is that? We could interpret that as her. We could interpret that as her mother, as the paragraph went mentioned. We could interpret that as her love interest, Nadia. We could interpret that as the ghost who's narrating the story. So there are a lot of women that this could be. And so that one verb is asking a lot of questions um, about the character. That was the densest verb of meaning that I could find in my own writing. They don't have to be like that. I, I was I was really drinking the verb juice when I when I wrote that that line, I think. So that is all for today's video. I hope that this just gave you a good jumping off point to start making up your own funky little verbs, you know? And maybe I've converted you, maybe I've ruined you. I'm sorry, once you start, it's hard to stop. My question for this video, what's your favorite verb, just like an actual verb, you know, not a made up one. And second of all, what's your favorite made up verb, whether that you've made up in your own writing or that you've encountered in the wild in someone else's writing. If you do want to read a writer who uses a lot of made up verbs, I'd recommend Kaming Chang's work. If you enjoy this style and you want to read a writer who I think does it better than anyone else, uh, Kaming Chang is my recommendation. So that's all for this video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in another video. Bye.